I'm sure you guys all know about the road crash statistics. Having two young kids, this freaked me out. I almost got carried away about all the crash statistics and thinking about this. And uh, it realized that, I mean, this is a very high volume, high cost scenario, especially for many patients that are under or uninsured, and particularly in the teen drivers. And, th and this is where I'm like, oh my God, I can't let my kids drive. And the distracted driving and you know and, and I admit it like even though I got a little bit of auto autopilot or pro pilot in the in in the car you know I'm sort of realized that every now and then the number of times that I respond to a text or answer a phone not that I legally admit to any text while driving in this conversation in a law school <laughs> but it's interesting how distracted we can be, and as simple as eating while you're driving or even phone calls. So, um, and, and that's a whole other, I think I'm going to probably give another, prepare another video blog uh, separately on that aspect and the, the medical distraction aspects of it. But, uh, and you know, my, definitely the part that scared me was the evening driving by teen drivers at night. However, one thing Ed uh, did tell me is that he said that you guys all love statistics, numbers, and multiple tables. So my entire presentation is we're going to dig deep into all the millions of data points in this road mortality rate. Just kidding. <laughs> yeah, I saw some glazed eyes and a couple people starting to and nod off saying, hey, wait, whoa, whoa, we're not statisticians. But <clears throat> essentially, uh, when it comes to motor vehicle crashes, typically on average, and depending on the height and obesity of the individual, especially whether it's motor vehicle to pedestrian, or whether there's airbags, or whether there's certain types of brakes or uh, foot brakes in a vehicle, and the speed and collision and the age of the vehicle, on average, lower limbs more than upper limbs, closed more frequently than uh, open, and, and tibias, typically more commonly than femurs, uh, uh, fractures in general. Now, the older patient may have the more, more femur fractures, maybe at lower velocity, lower energy. Uh, and then in the upper extremity, it's variable. You know, in some uh, uh, studies, you'll see clavicles more common. In other studies, the forearm. On average, when I see a motor vehicle crash, I typically see the forearm uh, and the clavicle more often than the proximal humerus. The proximal humerus being a very common fragility fracture where the older patient falls uh, and hurts themselves. And that's all variable. And um, I, I, I hope uh, you don't mind the gruesome uh, imagery, but you know some of the motor vehicle crashes that I've seen and we continue to see um, in various hospitals um, are very challenging. They, and, and the open fractures are the most difficult to uh, manage and treat for a variety of reasons that many of you already know if you treat patients with uh, vehicle injuries. And, um, I, I'm going to start with tibia fractures, and um, does anyone know why I put a motorcycle on this slide? So every time I think about, ah, it'd be cool to have a motorcycle, guaranteed within a week to, to typically the next day, I see a patient with a tibia fracture come in my office. And so for the last 20 years, plus maybe another 10 years if you count like uh, training, but like basically for the last 20 years, uh, I just have avoided even considering a motorcycle because it's inevitable that I will see a patient the next day with a motor, following a motorcycle crash. And the tibia fractures can be variable. <coughs> There's a, Sorry, I thought you had a question. So the tibia fractures can be variable. Um, you know, there's the simple closed fracture, as far as you can call tibia fracture simple, but in general, there are simple fractures, lower energy fractures, and obviously the energy that's transmitted can also uh, tra be transmitted to the soft tissues as well as the bone themselves. But typically, your run-of-the-mill, mid-shaft fracture that's relatively transverse, amenable to nail fixation, pretty straightforward, recovery's good, they don't have a lot of soft tissue trauma, assuming they don't get a blood clot, they do reasonably well. 
And then you get into some of the more complex uh, fractures, which are periarticular. And uh, sorry if you can't see. So some of the uh, fractures that are uh, periarticular, uh, they involve uh, areas of the joint. And then the, you can actually crush the joint. You can lose cartilage. And that, that's when you have osteochondral injuries where you get uh, collapse. And some of the uh, technology that we use for these fractures, and this is almost, you know, routine now. We have CD, uh, uh, CTs, we have 3D reconstructions, um, and we analyze it, we look at it, we manipulate um, on our screen how to uh, approach it, and typically you'll have time, because some of these fractures, they're not being done right away, and even if you, if they have an open fracture, you wash them out, you can treat them, you can plan your uh, procedure, and then you recover from that. So even this has become relatively routine. Now the outcome is variable and this is where a lot of times some of my patients ask is, uh, and I've had patients say, oh, you know, should I just take the money and run? Should I, you know, sign off on this? And I said, well, that's a difficult question because you will get arthritis. I mean, in that knee, which has this periarticular fracture or shoulder or hip, wherever it is, they're inevitably going to get uh, arthritis of some sort, some stiffness. So there are long-term consequences of it. And so uh, as much as it's complex, it's now routine. I remember seeing a 3D recon for the very first time when I was in uh, early residency, uh, end of med school and early residency, and we would only do it for complex acetabular fractures. And now I'll just routinely get it for every case that uh, suspect where a joint injury is suspected because it helps me treat the fracture better. And then you can deal with some of the soft tissue. So in some cases you have significant soft tissue injuries and sometimes this is something that you often will not even appreciate because sometimes you're dealing with documents and medical records. Hardly anyone takes pictures of the joint and if the surgeon or physician, if no one mention, mentions how severe the fracture blisters are, and sometimes it's mentioned in passing the patient was swollen, had to delay surgery, and that you know, can become a problem, but you know, picture's worth a, a thousand words, and in this case, clearly there's some devastating injury, fracture blisters, increased risk of uh, infection if you operate through a fracture blister until it's healed. So we can wait on these, and we have to wait on these. Um, yeah, Brett. Yeah, a good question. So fracture blisters aren't necessarily related to uh, compartment syndrome. So compartment syndrome is deep inside the tissue. And, and this patient actually had to get, uh, not only was it open, uh, he had to get fasciotomies. So the deep fascia, think of it like a balloon that, has, that can't expand anymore. It can't pop but you have to literally cut it in order to allow it to expand. And on the outside, through the interstitial edema into the dermal layers, there's so much swelling that the fluid and the blood escapes out. And you can have fracture blisters more commonly than you'll have compartment syndrome. So not be, so just because you have fracture blisters doesn't mean you have compartment syndrome and vice versa. And so fracture blisters are definitely less severe than compartment syndrome because you can watch these for a while. But it should be a sign to us physicians, and maybe when you guys are going through the report, ah, fracture blisters, think higher energy. Think m more soft tissue injury. So that means higher energy. Could there have been a compartment syndrome? So that's important that we think about, but it's probably something that you guys already think about as well. Yes? Do you, do you see that very often? Or is that a fairly small number of cases we have those? I, it's a small number, but if you, but if I think about my rotation at Cook County or, uh, you know, St Stanford when I was there at the level one trauma, uh, it's probably more common than you think. And if you, I don't go to the county, uh, San Jose Regional or any of the county hospitals right now, but that's probably more common there. And uh, certainly if you're in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, near the highway, um, where there's a big, huge trauma center, um, you're going to see high energy vehicular trauma and that's going to be much more common. It really comes down to the mechanism of injury and sometimes, especially with motorcycles, they'll collapse and it's a crushing type phenomenon, so the soft tissue fluid or a burn, maybe secondary to the burn off the vehicle as well. So that can be a, a significant problem. And I, I didn't really get into 
severe burns in motor vehicle crashes, but I mean, that's a whole other uh, topic altogether, but it's, it's an important point, but it's definitely a smaller percentage. Most of the patients don't come in with fracture blisters, but a high percentage of those that have had a vehicle crash with, say, even with uh, falling off a roof, uh, calcaneal fractures, they swell up. So it's not necessarily high energy vehicular trauma, but it's like the swelling has no place to go. So it just flows out into blisters. So again, you can wait on, on some of those. <clears throat> and fixation, sometimes you'll X-fix the patient before you definitively fix. And external fixation may become the definitive fixation if the alignment's good or if you have no choice. But in most cases, it's temporary stabilization that you do it. And one other important factor, and I, I don't know if you can appreciate it, um, I don't have my pointer, but basically the vessel is blocked off in this area. So fracture is here, and the vessel is blocked off right at this level of uh, the, the tibia fracture. And so the challenge, of course, is what do you do about that? So you have to multidisciplinary approach, increase risk of compartment sim syndrome after vascularizing. So that's always useful. I mean, I've had to review documents, um, you know, multiple times. And, and it, it, when you go through, you say, well, okay, this was a uh, fracture. He had pulse loss. Was there anything about temporary fixation, vascular angiogram, CT angiogram, what, what did they do, did they restore it, and how did they approach it, and how did they stabilize it? And then an open fracture. So in open fractures, um, you know, there's um, certain things that we do. You wash it out. Lavage is our, you know, fancy word for washing. That's all we do. And then there's a question of what do you use in that wash? Now, there's great data from an excellent trauma surgeon who does great studies and evidence that sometimes it may just be soap and water is all you need because he does international studies across third world countries and developing countries, sorry, developing countries, I shouldn't say third world countries, but um, they're evolving in their technology and they don't have all the fancy expensive drugs that we can put into our lavage saline. And so they found that soap and water works as good or better. It's just a, a mild detergent to wash out these wounds. Um, and then there's different levels of lavage. Do you just pour it in? Do you use high pressure? Do you use, use a pulse lavage, uh, lavage machine, which is being used right here, attached to a battery power where you're pulsing it in? Uh, think of it like a jackhammer, but it's pulsing the water in. Um, a really fun and painful tool that kids could would enjoy with uh, around the pool with clean water, but um, but this is high pressure. And then the question is: Is it high pressure or low pressure? And the data supports higher pressure for dirty soft tissue, lower pressure for intracortical damage, because high pressure can actually damage the intramedullary bone and the cancellous bone. So this technology was also new about 10 or 15 years ago, but it's routine now. We use it all the time. And external fixation again, and you can see here these pellets, that's not um, any kind of uh, pus or bacteria. There are actually antibiotic beads in order sometimes you have to do to prevent infection because the patient is sitting around with an open wound for a prolonged period of time. And then fixation, when it goes to fixation, sometimes you can have massive defects. And I've given another uh, talk where I've actually shown, um, you know, for uh, DOD related uh, material where you're actually showing massive IED blasts. And those have huge critical size defects. And I mean, the DOD is pouring, um, you know, funding towards companies that can solve that problem. And it's a big problem right now. Non-unions, infected non-unions, massive critical size defects. But this can happen to anyone. You get someone driving down uh, Gilroy, Pacheco Pass, they smash all over the road, they lose some fragments of tibia, it gets dirty, it's a farmland, they roll into and basically they've got massive defects. And then what do you do about it? And that's important as well. Now, currently our technology is, oh, okay, we put a bone graft, later you stage the procedure, you fill it in temporarily, maybe with a cement or beads, let the wound heal. The key to these types is healing the wound and put it dealing with the bone later. You can do bone docking, bone transport with fixation devices, um, or you can just put a strut. 
vascularized or not. So that means you take a fibula from same side or other side and you stick it inside, connect it to the vessels, or in some case, if, it, if it's not as bad, you may just use allograft fibula strut. And then hopefully you have it heal, but that's not always the case. And so that was lower extremity. Any, I'm going to go into shoulders if, uh, unless there's some uh, uh, burning questions or tables of statistics you want to see. Uh, one yeah. burning question. Yes. A couple of those radiographs, the, there was um, metal, you know, rod and screws yeah. in the tibia. Mm -hmm. With the complete <coughs> fracture of the fibula not yet treated, yeah. were they just checking to see after that first surgery? If everything was okay, and were they going to go on and put together the fibula? Yeah, that's a good question, and uh, patients ask that all the time. With uh, tibial tib fib fractures, we call them for short. You don't often fix the fibula. The times where you sometimes do is sometimes distal fractures where they're at the same level. Um, especially if there's significant displacement because then it gets down to shoe wear and a risk for malalignment. But typically, if you can stabilize the tibia in a mid-shaft, you don't even have to worry about the fibula. And typically, you don't fix the fibula. Sometimes where you will is if you're very distal because you, have, uh, you don't have as much uh, fixation distally. And so your moment arm, if you can imagine, is higher. So the ability for it to toggle from a higher fixation point in the diaphysis, even if you have screws there, is higher. So you'll sometimes fix the fibula to make sure your alignment is there and it doesn't, go, uh, it doesn't risk going into valgus or, or sometimes varus which is just the alignment of in the coronal plane, which is this plane going valgus or varus. Right, one final little question along those lines. So if there's a non-union of that fibula, yeah. is it irrelevant since it's non-weight bearing? And is it going to continue to never get together again? Yeah, another uh, good question. Uh, Non-unions of the fibula don't always need to get treated. Typically, most of the weight, you know, more than 80% goes through the tibia. But uh, sometimes if it's a painful pseudarthrosis or non-union, and the patient's bothered by it and they can feel it moving, it's a, it's a consideration to fix it, absolutely. And it could be a source of pain, but usually it heals well, and you don't worry about it. Even if it's crooked, it tends not to have... A significant problem because around the fibula, especially proximally and even sometimes distally, you have the uh, common perineal nerve. And when, when it and as it continues down as the perineal nerve, then you could risk injury if you go in to fix something with scar tissue. So the challenge, just like removing hardware, sometimes is riskier than fixing the bone. Going in to fix a, a fracture later um, you know, puts other neurovascular injuries at risk, so then it's a benefit-risk ratio. And that's an important facet of information, and that's why you know, consent, detailed discussion with the patient, all, I mean, you can never talk about everything. I mean, you know, uh, I, I, sometimes in, in um, uh, depositions you, you get asked, well, did they talk about all the possibilities? Well, you can't talk about everything because there's so many things we don't know and there's only things that you can reasonably discuss because anyone can die. But are you going to tell a patient they're going to, they will have a high likelihood of dying doing something? <laughs> No, but they may have a risk for nerve or vessel injury. So you want to be as encompassing or comprehensive as you can. Yeah. One more follow-up. Sure, yeah. Do you put these risks in a report? Oh, uh, yes, often you do. And, and, and nowadays with um, uh, electronic health records, it makes it easier. And as much as I know um, many people don't like templates and uh, uh, you know, health records, it makes it easier. Because I'll just put my shortcut dot risks and I have dot risks for shoulder jo joint replacements, arthroscopies, and everything. And because I'm saying the same thing. And so rather than trying to type and write the same thing, I've got a template shortcut for that. But you do want to go through that with the patient. And that's our way of including that into the chart. So ideally, you do. But as physicians, we're typically trained to do that. Uh, and, you know, ultimately the, the medical record is our, our, our golden album, and so we really should be very vi vigilant as physicians to include it because you guys are going to be looking for it. Yeah, so, so uh, we're going to move into shoulders, and shoulder dislocations can happen uh, during um, uh, injuries, and uh, they're 
probably relatively common. Most of the times they're benign, but it's important to know what age group and how it happened and to be very hyper vigilant about how the treatment followed because there can be subtle or occult findings that can be missed. Now, if you're older than 40, first thing that pops in your head is, oh, if they don't have a fracture and it was a dislocation only, did they have an associated rotator cuff tear? And that's routine. And if they're young, then they have a high risk. If they're under 20, especially at their first time dislocating, they have a high risk of re-dislocating. And more commonly, they have labral injuries. So you have to repair the labrum early for these younger patients. And for the older patients, they don't have the labral problem. They'll often tear their rotator cuff because it tends to be attrition or age related and they'll tear their cuff before they tear their uh, labrum. Yes. The argument that everything is degenerative and pre-existing uh, in the shoulder and the rotator cuff is not dramatically caused. How do you deal with that? Yeah, that's a, a good question, but uh, there's definite evidence and data, um, level one evidence, saying that you can get a traumatic rotator cuff uh, uh, rupture in, uh, in a patient with a dislocation. Um, the MRI isn't always useful, and sometimes these patients are coming to me a year or two years or sometimes three years after their injury. It's shocking how late they show up and I'm asked to give a, a, an opinion, but you know, you really have to go by what's likely. You know, were they having shoulder problems before and then they didn't. Now, I could argue, and I could easily argue that with embryological data and data on 40 year olds and 60 year olds that we're degenerating from the age that we're born. So we could argue that, oh, you're going to have degenerative problems happening from a young age, and there are patients asymptomatic with cuff tears, but on an MRI they have a tear, but they're asymptomatic. And then you have patients that have attrition, but not a tear, that are very symptomatic. So, and then there are cases where you can argue that a, a, a rupture is traumatic. If they have hematoma, they have evidence of a clear disruption line, you don't have the uh, degenerative fat atrophy changes, if that MRI was done acutely within, say, two to three months of the injury. Now, if it's more than three to six months, uh, they may already have fat atrophy, you may have attritional changes, so then it's hard to tell. So then you really have to go by what happened, what happened with the patient, um, and, 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 and it's really case by case. But um, I, I see that as, as, as definitely challenging um, in terms of, well, you had it before. Well, there's a lot of things patients have bef had before, um, you know, and, and you could argue, like my ACL and meniscus, I know that, well, I never had an injury until I played soccer. My first year in San Francisco, I blew it out and so it ruined my summer, but I had it repaired. Now I'm likely going to develop arthritis and degenerative changes. And so there are likely things. Did I have knee problems before? No. Has anyone had a back problem before? Sure, but does that mean you get in a car accident and end up with cauda equina or a burst fracture that, and they had associate, and you also had degenerative changes that um, it's, the degenerative changes caused all that? Uh, unlikely. So it, it really has to be case by case, but I completely understand that salient point you're referring to because it can be a challenge if you don't have good documentation or the patient never saw a doctor before ever in his life or her life, so it, may, it becomes challenging. Yes? Yeah. Uh, I see the shoulder making the causation argument much more difficult in the typical rear end crash. Hmm. And, you know, the defense is there's no mechanism for that injury on the shoulder. So that's where I see the biggest problem connecting them. Oh, interesting, interesting. Well, I mean, when it comes to, ma there, there isn't as good data in that uh, area, but with side passenger airbags uh, falling into the front seat, there's a lot, I mean, you could land your arm on the dash, on this, uh, the center console, on the front, uh, um, sorry, on the back of the uh, seat. So um, I think it's case by case. Um, it's interesting that you say it's hard to challenge because from a, anatomic, physiologic, biomechanical mechanism of action, seeing car crashes, um, even um, you know, modeled, you could argue that you could have a, a shoulder injury. Um, I mean, really anything could be injured in that case. And from head injury to shoulder 
to dashboard knee injuries. Usually with the hip and the shoulder harness, you're just not, you know, barring, you know, you were reaching and you saw something about to happen in your right. face. You're not going to get the force on the shoulder. Yeah, you'd think that, but somehow my kids loosen that seatbelt, and when I suddenly break, they hit the back of the seat with their arms or their head, and they're in a fully modern child protective safety seat with a restraint in a Volvo. <laughs> you know, safest car made. And uh, I have to say, stay in your seat. But somehow or the other, they find their arms in a weird way. And somehow or the other, all of a sudden, my, my daughter loves rubbing the ear. I, I, I don't know if any of you um, had kids that they just love rubbing the ear. So when my daughter's feeling tired on the, on the ride home, she'll somehow pull the seatbelt all the way. She'll sit right on the edge of her car seat and reach behind the seat and, and rub my, mo uh, my wife's, uh, I, I was gonna say mom, but it's mommy, because we always refer to each other as mommy and daddy, but rubbing her ear. And it's like, wait, okay, that's a shoulder dislocation if anything were to happen. So I, I think, um, you know, the arguments, I, I think if you dig enough in the literature, you could find, uh, computational modelings and biomechanics of shoulder injuries. Uh, I'm sure with all the crash data is out there. Um, and uh, I'm actually going to search that for myself. I haven't actually seen rear passenger shoulder injury modelling. Or, or uh, Sorry? The driver who gets rear-ended. Oh, the driver who gets rear-ended. Right. Oh, I mean, that, uh, to me, from a mechanism standpoint, doesn't seem as as, um, as uh, not possible, uh, but maybe the legal arguments are more challenging. Um, but yeah, that's a good question, yeah. Forgive me, uh, yeah. Oh, I, I, ha I, I haven't testified at trials. I've, I've done some uh, depositions and some uh, legal work. Um, if I have to, um, um, you know, I'm happy to. I did uh, provide a deposition on the behalf of defense on a, I don't, uh, on a case where a sheriff ran uh, down a bunch of cyclists. It never went to trial, uh, but I had to provide a deposition. So um, I don't know if I w how I would feel in uh, going to trial, but, I mean, all you do is be honest. I mean, yeah. Yeah. The practical problem of trying to convince lay people mm. of something. And so pictures like you have here are, are wonderful. Yeah. I just wondered if you could use those in trial, maybe use a deposition or anything like that. Oh, yeah. Oh, sure. I mean, uh, when it comes to trying to simplify complex problems, that is my forte. I love doing that. And if you guys are interested, you should check out my video blog because I and subscribe. I, I, I've, I've got probably over 20,000 on Instagram and um, probably 500 su subscribers. And it started off as just about patient education, just simplifying complex problems so patients could understand what they're going through. And, and then it just became fun. I started enjoying uh, being in front of the camera, explaining difficult things, um, having a, a whiteboard, and um, I actually just got a company sponsor me. They sent me a 70-inch uh, screen whiteboard saying, hey, we want you to put this on uh, so people see our logo on the whiteboard. So uh, I think it, 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 that's a, it's in a good question you have, but, uh, but yes, making s uh, complex problems simple is something I really enjoy doing. I mean, I taught it uh, medical students and residents at Stanford, and, and now it's all about trying to make patients understand, because for me, I, I, and I really feel strongly about that, is patient consent is the most important part of any surgical um, you know, procedure. And I really want to make sure the patient understands. So, um, and my MAs may say otherwise, but I often spend time, a lot more time with the patients trying to make sure they understand and I'll end up going over time, but they'll just book around it. So it, it, it's really important to, um, you know, uh, make sure the patients understand. So yeah, um, that's something uh, that I, I do and happy to help if there's challenging problems like that. Um, I mean, I, 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 I will say that I am critical myself and I, and I do provide a balanced opinion and I'm honest. I mean, I, I, can't, I, I can't be not honest. It's obvious on my face if I'm not being honest. So, um, and that's just who I am. But, uh, but great question, yeah.
So uh, let me uh, move on. So the, this is probably the most important x-ray on a shoulder dislocation reduction. Um, it's the axillary view. Now you can't always get an axillary view. Sometimes you have to get a modified Velpo axillary view. But this is the, shows the golf ball on the golf tee. If you don't have that, you could be more than 20 to 30% likely that you don't have a complete reduction. Or you get a CT scan. And mo nowadays, a lot of times the ER docs just get a CT scan because they don't have to figure out, uh, one, the tech at night may not be able to get the axillary view. Uh, they don't want to think about it. They're, you know, they're running around seeing other patients, so they get the CT scan. And so, but this is the view you need because if you look at these x-rays, this, could have been reduced, and it might look reduced on an AP view, but if you get the, or even a lateral view, or the Mercedes uh, view, where this is dislocated, it may look reduced, but until you get a proper axillary view or an axial CT, this is an anterior fracture dislocation, this is a locked posterior fracture dislocation. So that's important as well, and that's something we're essentially trained uh, to do. Uh, lots of uh, dislocations can be associated with fractures, all sorts. You can knock the head completely off, just the tuberosity. And in this case, this one looks great, right? However, on CT, they have a glenoid fracture. So it may look good if you miss that subtle cortical irregularity, then you may think, oh, okay, it's reduced, it's fine, it's an undisplaced tuberosity fracture. After the reduction, patient goes on, I've seen this happen, and the patient comes back a year or two later, and now he's got poorly vascularized cortical uh, loose body that's outside here, and then they have a defect that you then have to go in and allograft, and that can become more of a challenge of reconstructing afterwards. So uh, diligence, due diligence in everything. Um, so again, we, this has become routine, getting uh, CT scans, reconstructions, finding uh, the glenoid uh, fractures associated with it, um, and looking for other types of soft tissue lesions along with the fracture and the dislocation itself. And then this is getting to the rotator cuff tear, supraspinatus coming, sharp edge here, it should be attached over here, fluid, bone, fat, soft tissue, there should be something interposing and there isn't. Labrum, labral tear, here's the nice triangle, it's off right here. So you know that the patient had an anterior dislocation at some point. And then you can get various other lesions such as a slap tear. Now this is very obvious uh, to highlight it, but it doesn't always come across that obvious in uh, findings. And if a patient's symptomatic, I mean, the important thing is, and this is something that I don't know why technology hasn't caught up. And, um, I actually have a blog that you guys will probably either love or hate. It's called Lawyers Will Save Healthcare. And the idea basically is that until we get class action lawsuits by patients and patient advocates about poor care, that a class action lawsuit against insurance companies is the only way to bring quality healthcare to patients. And you either love it or hate it, but it's one of those things that if a patient is symptomatic, you have to listen to the patient. Something's going on until you can rule it out. And sometimes it could be chronic pain. Could be a lot of things we don't understand, and there could be subtle findings. And the reason I bring this up is, how do we take an MRI? Do you guys have a sense? Have you ever had an MRI done? Okay, what do they do? They lay you down. Right. So you're lying down static like this, getting an MRI. Now, is that gonna show a slap tear? Maybe, but not always. So if you have pain when you do this, do you think an MRI is gonna catch it? Not always. So sometimes we'll get an MRI with the patient with the arm up, or with traction down, or with the arm across, just to see. And you know, trying to get insurance to authorize sometimes that is very difficult and challenging. Oh, standing MRI has its value. I think it's very valuable for uh, lower extremity weight bearing. Um, and same for the shoulder. If you can add some traction, um, it's useful. For some patients, they're claustrophobic getting in. I think um, the, the MRIs that, and CTs that are, have them standing, um, the more commercialized ones go up to about the knee. Because once you go higher, it's much more difficult, much more expensive. Yeah, because those are the ones that you hear pitched for spine. Yeah, saying that exactly. You know, 
laying, you have no load, but yep. if you're standing, you have a load. Absolutely. And then, you know, a dynamic image would be ideal because then you're moving, you can actually go through the motions of what you're doing, so you can see. So, again, an MRI is a static picture, it's like one moment in time. And what you need to see is mo moments where the patient's moving. I had a knee scope the other day where patient told me something's going on, but all we could find on the MRI was a small cyst on the ACL. It was so minor. And I've had patients that feel cysts intraarticularly and they get better. And um, she went through a phase where she was pregnant, had pain, so we couldn't do anything, couldn't get imaging. She had her baby, then we did the imaging, saw her, and she said she's still symptomatic. Well, guess what I found? A loose body in the uh, medial gutter that we didn't see on the MRI. You, it just, you couldn't appreciate it because it's lost in the soft tissue shadow. Right, so yeah. I'm always told that when you have the MRIs in the joints, uh, despite how good they are, you never know until you go in there arthroscopically. So you'll get false positives yep. on the MRI and go in and not find something. Yep. Or It'll, you'll not see anything, and you go in, you find loose bodies. Oh, absolutely. And I will say that, I mean, at this point, it, uh, it's not as common to have that uh, finding. I mean, MRIs are pretty well 95 to 99 percent, but there is a high, there can be false negatives and false positives as well. And we've all been fooled at times. But I agree, for complex, especially for the shoulder, it's a very dynamic joint. So sometimes you have to assess how unstable the labrum is because it may look like it's tethered and attached, but you go in there and you clearly see uh, findings that aren't correlated. And so when I was working with the, uh, when I was at the FDA in the computational modeling um, uh, division, working with the team, one of the things was how good in the resolution can you get? How can you look at cartilage? Can you look at cartilage with certain types of regenerative technology? And the technology is not there. So for anyone to sit on, well, I don't, I, I don't want to make the correlation to, um, you know, sitting on the stand, but if anyone were to stand anywhere and say that, well, the MRI is, is negative and there's no way there could be something, we just don't know enough. An MRI is, again, a static image in one moment of time with the amount of technology we have. So, yeah. So, so are you saying there are scans that can be done to show why somebody hurts? Is that what I mean? Oh, there can't. So you can see, right. my goodness, and you can explain to people. Well, so it's not common. We don't have dynamic MRIs uh, as of yet. We uh, can model a, a person's motion, like baseball players and, and tennis players, um, and we can get an MRI with the patient having the arm raised. It's still a static picture, though. We don't have the ability to get, it would be um, cost prohibitive, and, you would, and, and the challenge with the technology is that the patient has to be absolutely still, because we're not imaging the joint. We're actually looking at the ref, uh, reflection of water. So what you're so. saying is there are creative ways to use MRIs, but you can yes. show someone why they hurt. Yeah. If anybody in the room will agree, yeah. you can't put your client on the stand and say, I hurt, and without showing a reason, the jury goes to sleep. Mm -hmm. they, need to, they need to see something. You're saying there are. There are in certain cases, like especially for difficult uh, slap tears or labral tears, sometimes we will get them uh, to put their arm out. But I mean, and clinically, if, I, if someone is suspected of having a labral tear or a slap tear, I'll take them to the OR. I, I mean, I don't have to get the, um, you know, the static, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the arm further out, because more often than not, it's a battle with the insurance company, but they'll approve the surgery before they approve therapy and further imaging. It's amazing. <laughs> you know, they'll pay thousands of dollars for an operation, most of which goes to the hospitals and facilities, um, rather than getting an additional few tests or, or, or more therapy. So, so. so is it the, the 3T MRI that, that now has the better resolution? Ideally, yeah. I mean, you could, I mean, so if you get 100 radiologists in a room, they would argue, well, 2T is good enough for this, and, 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 but 3T, but typically I, I tend to send people to 3T MRIs. And there are, some patients don't have that. They'll come and they won't have a 3T MRI and the resolution is poor. And I think it's hard to justify making a, a decision with a poor quality MRI. It's kind of like taking a grainy image, like we actually had a theft in our office. Some guy snuck in at lunch and 
and and took some a wallet out of one of the uh, uh, woman's uh, purse and walked right out. Literally, he had two minutes between when he walked in and walked out between someone passing by, and we have him on camera. But do you think he's going to get caught? No, because it's too grainy. You know, like and and can you imagine like putting a video like that? It could look like a hundred thousand people in San Jose. So. But I, I agree, a, a resolution is everything. Um, and uh, so shoulder fractures, lots of different treatments. They're basic treatments if you just had a tuberosity. I, I rarely use wires. Um, oftentimes we have fiber tape or various types of suture brands that are thick and that are almost stronger or as strong as stainless steel. And I would say they're stronger because they have the elasticity. They won't bend and break. So oftentimes you'll see just a screw without anything, but there was clearly some tension band wiring uh, done with sutures. Um, sometimes you have to replace it, sometimes you fix it, and in other cases you try and fix it, but it falls apart because you get loss of blood supply and you have to replace it. And this is a reverse total shoulder that you sometimes have to do. So, um, and in this particular case you can see even if you do things well, they can fall apart. So in the end, they may need to go on to other surgery. So you can't always guarantee an income. Healthcare medical treatment is gray, you know, and uh, I know law is black and white, right? It's very clear, right? Healthcare is it. Um, so uh, anything more on shoulders and then we'll move on to femurs and I don't want anyone to fall asleep, but I like the dynamic. I, I, I want the questions to keep coming. So uh, femur fractures, same principles. Basic fractures, complex fractures, you can end up with fractures needing CT scans. Um, and then you get into hip fractures. Some of them can be fixed. Sometimes they, even if you fix them, they fail. Some of them need to be replaced. Um, and some of them get rotted and some of them get percutaneous screws. You can have vascular injuries. This is a devastating trauma terrible bone loss and vascular injury and sometimes you try and reconstruct it as best you can and you have to deal with uh, defects. Knee dislocations. This is something that's um, you know really important because if you have a knee dislocation that patient needs an angiogram no matter what. Intimal tears, arterial ruptures, you need to know whether they had some type of vessel injury and the associated soft tissues are probably easier to deal with than um, you know, not missing uh, a vessel injury. So when we're trained, if you have a, someone showing up with a, a true knee, not just a patella dislocation, I'm talking about a true knee dislocation, you have to get the CT angio. Even if they have a pulse, it's almost like it's the CYA for us. Just get the CT angio, make sure they have no vessel injury because they have, could have an intimal rupture that's show up later and you want to document that. Critical, critical size bone defects. So in, typically in, in humans, if it's more than about a centimeter to two centimeters, two centimeters is currently the, the evidence that we use. But if you have a big defect in bone, that's a criti critical size bone defect. That means you can't weight bear, you can't walk, and you have to fill it in with something. And there's currently, there's lots of options. Aren't great. You have allograft, you have some kind of scaffold, you have various different uh, technologies. And um, I'm going to, next few slides are going to get into some of the advanced technologies and some of it pushing the cusp of, of innovation as well. That's fun. Um, but we talked about fibular strut graft, but you can use a lot of the things in the tibia. You often have to use in the femur as well. And then you get a lot of these calcium phosphate uh, cements and, and, and pellets. So the technology of devices, uh, you know, I feel like overall in orthopedics, we're still, you know, Carpenters, we're still doing things the way we did. We haven't changed a lot. And uh, some of it's related to why, you know, cars slowly evolve. Well, technology and devices slowly evolve. So over time, they've become more anatomic. They've become lower profile. We're now using color-coded titanium more than we are stainless steel. They're softer on the edges. They have suture holes for capturing soft tissues. And then you can even have these expandable cages to fill in for fragility fractures where the bone is lost. So you need to fill it in and let the bone grow in. So all sorts of technologies. For distal femur, the big change 
within the last 15 years was retrograde nail. So sometimes a patient has had a femur fracture, but their main incision was from the knee and we retrograde the femur in. And so that sometimes can be a little uh, confusing to someone who doesn't understand, but the nail went in from distal antegrade, retrograde instead of antegrade, which is going down the pipe. And so that's sort of routine. I mean, that's been something that's slowly evolving. The other area that's evolved really rapidly, especially within the last 10 years, are variable angle. You know, and you'd think they would have come up with this sooner, right? I mean, when you're working in the, in the shop or on some projects, you always want, you gotta pick your angle, right? Well, in typical orthopedic plates, um, we had we were fixed in terms of how we could place these screws and we wanted to lock them and you had a limit on the pitch so you had to hit the screw a certain way so it wouldn't be too proud well now a lot of companies have come up to, to variable angle where you can lock them and you can have an angle not just 15 and some but as much as 30 degrees where you can actually get the screw to sit in the plate and lock it. And that's transformed technology because now we can have really strong, durable fixation and less likelihood of loosening of that fixation. Because you have to remember, the body is biologic. It'll keep growing, healing, and moving. The plate is fixed and rigid. It'll either break if the bone doesn't heal, or, but it's not gonna grow and, and, and mold. Um, and that was actually another blog I did specifically as to um, some of the technological advances that we'll talk about briefly as to why are we so fixated on inert products when we really want biologically positive, active products in our bodies to grow and heal with us. And so this is uh, just a blow up of the screw head which allows it to lock into the plate. We've also started using more cement fixation. It's kind of like reinforced concrete. I mean, again, this has only really started within the last you know, 10 or 15 years. We've been using it for probably 20 or 30 years, but really within the last few years, we've started to incorporate the technology within the device so that the flutes of the device and the way the cement flows is taken into account. So you get cement extrusion out the side ports instead of out the end because you want it to truly stabilize the fixation here because in a fragile hip fracture you're going to need better fixation it helps support the plateau as well and those are things that have evolved and advanced and then of course you've all heard about 3d printing and additive manufacturing and that's something where you can start customizing plates and that has taken off now if i were in australia i could print an implant and sterilize it and put it in a patient without having to go through the FDA. Because all I have to say is that I needed this for my patient. Very different in most other countries. So the regulations are slightly different. So there's no truly custom implant in the US unless it goes through a humanitarian exemption through the FDA. So in this particular case, these are uh, plates based on anatomical characteristics of hundreds of cadavers or CT scans and they come up with plates that match 80 to 90 percent of humans out there. Sorry, but Brett, I, I had a, you saw a question. So, good question. So the outcomes is uh, something we, we have anecdotal evidence but they're coming. For locking plates, there's good solid evidence that it helps. In young bone, a locking plate isn't necessarily better than a regular plate, but with a lot of these newer technologies, patients are saying they, they don't feel them as often. They're easier for the surgeon to put in because there's less thinking involved. You've got uh, better angles you can get. So it may not be something, and we'll probably see the outcomes um, you know, down the pipeline, but a lot of this is happening. And starting to print implants, you know, I think the customized idea where you can actually, so instead of having, picking like between, you know, zero to 10 shoes, you're actually getting a shoe that fits you exactly. That's not quite there yet, but we're matching patients based on the jig, so we can customize the jig for the patient and we can uh, match certain things for the patient. And you probably heard about a company called Conformis that is printing 
um, you know, the jigs and trying to match the patient. Their implants aren't printed, but they're matching the patient's anatomy towards their joint replacements. And those are things that are happening as well. And um, so, and then the other thing is shifting from metal to other types of um, plastics. And so right now, uh, peak, PECA, PEC, PECA, there's all sorts of different variations on these polyether ketones uh, out there. And there's various screws and cages. I, I, I don't do spine surgery, although I, I see patients with overlapping spine problems because they often overlap knee and hip and, and shoulder problems and I defer them to the spine surgeon. But you can have cages and screws that are all made of various materials. So this is another uh, foray into alternative options. And we already use that in sports medicine where we do um, you know, absorbable uh, plastics, essentially, PLLA and PLGA. The other thing that's really been exciting for my patients is how we're closing their skin. Now, in trauma fractures, you may not always be able to get perfectly healed wounds, but if you're doing late fixation, you can. And, and I use the Prinio often. It, no more railroad tracks. I, I don't like railroad tracks, but they're inevitable in some trauma patients. If you're doing multi-trauma, by the time you're done the case, it's about surgeon fatigue. You want to just get it and uh, done and get out of there. Um, but, uh, you know, avoiding scarring. This was actually developed by a medical student at Stanford who got tired of closing wounds. So he basically came up with a zip tie. So he put one end on one side of the wound, one on the other, clipped them together and zip, 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 zip. And it's the coolest thing. I don't use it because it, it just gets patience. It, catches on cloth and clothes, and it's, it's not as nice, and I prefer this one much more. Uh, but it is useful in trauma because you can avoid the staples. So in trauma, a lot of people have switched to zip line because you're not embedding the tissues and creating scars. The other technology that's really t taken off in the last five, uh, 10 years, especially, especially in the last five years, it's called VAC therapy for wounds. And, and typically, any open fracture that comes in, I put this. It's a piece of foam attached to a suction tubing. It's as simple as that. It's the simplest technology devices that are billion dollar um, uh, industries. So you cr uh, basically allows you to take out the fluid and allows the wound to close. And now they have a version of the VAC, vacuum assisted therapy, that you can put on fresh wounds to allow healing. And I use that, it's, uh, it's a different term, but um, I use that on my uh, large obese patients that are diabetics for big joints um, and hips. Um, or fracture care because you, you get less wound seepage, less risk of infection, especially in the diabetic. So that's an example of VAC. In this case, he's getting a double VAC. So he has suction in one area, irrigation in the other. So there, and we often use that in, uh, in badly infected cases where, you know, uh, I mean, this patient didn't end up having necrotizing fasciitis, but sometimes if they end up, you have to put this, and all that gray is foam, and you literally have saran wrap on top. I mean, it's not saran wrap, but it's a version of that, but it's sticky, uh, clear plastic. So you can watch the wound. And what's interesting is that back when I did a rotation at Vancouver General, um, uh, we would basically put the equivalent of a tagoderm, which is clear plastic, and you cover up the wound with antibiotic beads so you can keep an eye on the wound. And that eventually evolved um, to this technology because people found it very useful. And now, if you were to attach a suction tubing to any wound covered in plastic, you will get a letter from the company saying you're violating their patent, and, 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 uh, and so you can't do that. You have to use their device. So it's brilliant. It's, it's like, wish I, wish I uh, invented it. But uh, so then uh, regenerative technology. So then it could be as simple as, well, you know, we need bone to grow. So why don't you let the bone cells and the collagen do their job? So you put scaffolds and on average, it's about between 300 to 500 microns of size, of pore size that bone likes to grow. And lots of data show that. So if you can create these scaffolds that are essentially constructs, think of it like a bamboo ladder, um, and you put that in, it allows things to grow. You can add collagen, you can add various regenerative products, you can add uh, bone graft, and then allow it to grow. But it's still synthetic, and you're uh, trying to get it to grow. 
Silk is another thing. I love silk. I mean, uh, you know, silk is something nano uh, spun silk is, is going to be a big thing um, um, in the next uh, decade um, uh, until bioprinting really takes off. But which I'll get into, but there's a lot of different ways you can create these fabrics and matrices that allow bone cells and blood to grow in and create new bone. Nothing's perfect yet, so this is eventually evolving um, as well. And then you get into cellular technology, and I, I do actually do a lot of stem cells and PRP and, and stem cell treatments for various things. For fractures, the data is still variable. However, there's good evidence that it can help with stem cells. And if you have a fracture that's not healing, more than likely at some point, that patient is gonna get uh, stem cells or something to help the bone grow. And people have used all sorts of other types of treatments like Forteo, which is for osteoporosis, but if a baseball pitcher breaks their metacarpal uh, or, uh, or their football player breaks their metatarsal, more than likely they're going to get injectable Forteo until the bone heals because they want them back on the field. So we know that there are certain drugs that help healing, but then there's also cellular technology uh, where you can actually help with progenitor cells to help with healing. This is still evolving, but this is, you know, I mean, if I ever give this talk again 10 years from now, this is going to become a routine slide. And then I'll be talking about all the different companies that make fracture healing stem cell applications in a packet. So we're not there yet. Well, and you tell us about yeah. platelet therapy? Oh yeah, platelet therapy. So platelet-rich plasma, so that's where you take your blood, you concentrate the growth factors by doing this proprietary spin, and it's your growth factors and your stem cells, uh, uh, well, not so much stem cells, but your growth factors um, and, and platelets, which are the ones that actually expel, expel the uh, pl uh, growth factors, um, and you concentrate that, and then you can inject it into various areas. And, You've probably heard of the PRP for all sorts of aesthetic um, situations, but pe people are using, I use PRP for tendinitis, um, for uh, osteoarthritis, for pain relief. It's variable, the outcomes and results, and people have tried PRP liquid injectables, gels, and, and combining it with scaffolds for fracture healing. Uh, but that's basically what PRP is. It's not covered by insurance, though. So you yeah. need to get all that, the stem cells and things usually from the particular patient? Yeah, so that's a good question. So there's autologous stem cells. So right now, say, say someone comes in saying, you know, I've got grade one, grade two osteoarthritis. I've heard of stem cells, what can you do? Well, I do an office procedure where I take some bone marrow out of their hip through a special process and needle. I take that bone marrow, uh, which are primarily progenitor stem cells, and I inject it into their uh, knee joint uh, such that it helps give them the possibility for healing. But those stem cells are from the patient. Now there are people, and this is still going to be another 10 or 20 years away, allogeneic, and that's where it's banked, or you take your stem cells and bank it, or you grow them and give it back to you. The, yeah. 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 But yeah. Healthy absolutely. Maybe that would help. Yeah, absolutely. So the idea of allogeneic is completely off the radar right now. I mean, it's not regulated. It's actually not allowed. It's purely for research, and um, it's something that uh, there are places maybe overseas that are doing it. So sometimes, like I've had patients that have said, oh, I'm going to go get stem cells for my spine, which is totally controversial, and no one's doing it in the U.S. Um, well, there's probably some cases of, of that you've heard about where someone showed up from an unlicensed or expired chiro licensed chiropractor who was injecting people with amniotic stem cells, which, is, which were not stem cells, and they ended up with brown pus coming out of their joints. And that, that was big in the news. And that was unbelievable what people will do. I mean, it's, I just, I don't know why, you know, people will take an idea and just market it beyond evidence. And you have to stay within the realms of evidence. And even for me, when I talk to patients about it, I said, this is a possibility. This is the data. This is the level one evidence. This are the variables. I can't guarantee results, but we don't have anything between 
middle-aged recreational athlete and total knee replacement that's reliable. Are you seeing insurance companies covering stem cells? So I've had, um, so they don't cover uh, stem cells or PRP. I've had a couple of workers' comp patients after uh, um, uh, patients have suffered and suffered and I provided a statement and letter with all the evidence. Um, I've had maybe a few actually pay for the stem cells. I've had others that have said they're going to pay and didn't. So then I, uh, they're, they're, uh, so workers' comp is variable. So, um, uh, but what, right now what the insurance company tends to pay for the code is they will say, okay, we'll pay for the visit, we'll pay for the injection, the blood draw, the, the bone extraction, but we're not actually going to pay for stem cells. So I might get like a couple hundred bucks from the insurance company, but the actual procedure is cash pay out of pocket from the patient with the appropriate uh, risk benefit disclosure statements and um, uh, that the patient has to sign. Yeah. So, so that pretty well is in a nutshell. Everything about uh, the advances in orthopedics and uh, uh, technology squeezed down to a few slides. Um, and there's always something new. I, I'm always helping startups, and so that's the fun part of what I do. Um, and that's always fun. And um, I just wanted to end with a picture of my uh, family, uh, just so you guys uh, know. Um, oh, wait, how did Carrie Price get? Uh, so if you guys want to see the Sharks lose tonight, I'll be at the game, and the Canadians are going to win. Yeah. So thank you again.